Good morning, church family. And Lisa's going to say, turn on that microphone. <laughs> Good morning, church family, and welcome to Bible Believers Community Church, where the name says it all. Today, we are going to start our first Sunday School Bible study. Uh, for we, we had one much earlier in our ministry, but it didn't generate a lot of uh, interest, so it kind of feigned, which really, that was my fault. I pray for forgiveness because um, whether people show up or not, if God called me to do a Bible study or a, a Sunday school class, that's what I should be doing. So um, we're getting ready to um, we're getting ready to, to start a new Bible study, but before we get going, I'd like to just say Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. <laughs> I love mothers. Uh, I love my mother. I miss her. She passed away this past year, but I still love her. And the good news is she was born again, so I'm going to get to be with her in glory when I go, or when I get raptured, whichever comes first. And so... Uh, we just, we're getting ready to start this Bible study. So before we even get started, let's go to the Lord and ask for his blessing on this thing. Lord, we do thank you for this Sunday. We thank you for all the mothers that brought children into this world, Lord, and that, uh, that, that uh, raised them up. And Lord, we pray that you give those mothers wisdom in how to bring their children up in a way that they'll remember you and love you and serve you. And um, God, we pray over this Sunday school. Um, beginnings of this lesson Lord that you just put your anointing hand of grace upon it and Lord that you'd be the one that teaches the people that you'd use me as a mouthpiece if you will and that I wouldn't get in the way of what you want your children to know and that um, eyes would be open to some things that maybe they've never seen before and maybe it would just reinforce some stuff that they know and make them get on fire for you again that's the goal Lord that would be a bright and shining light in this dark world that we live in today. We praise you for all that you do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this might seem a little weird to some people, but I'm going to say it anyhow. And that is, um, the more experience a pastor gets in following the Lord and doing what the Lord wants him to do, the more clearly he can see what it is the Lord wants him to do and 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 uh, follow the, the leading of the Holy Ghost. But I'd say most preachers, myself included, most preachers in the very beginning of their ministries do a lot of things in the power of the flesh. They, they can't help but focus on what they should be doing and because they're so focused on what they should be doing, they're not listening to the Holy Ghost. And so they're doing what they uh, think is right. Now, my first job as a pastor, and I preached for a long time before I came, became a pastor, but there's something that happens to a man, and I say a man because only a man can be a pastor according to the Bible. Amen. There's something that happens to the a past to a man when he gets his first pastor when he starts pastoring his first church, and um, I don't think it necessarily happens to every single man, but I imagine it happens to most, and that is the pressure of. I remember when I was going through Bible school, I was always concerned about how am I going to think of things to how am I <laughs> going to think of things to preach. Uh, that will fill up the, all the services that we're going to have and the focus is on I and but that changes over time as you begin to see because now I scratch my head and say man the Lord has so many things he wants me to teach I'm never in my lifetime going to have enough time to do everything that he wants me to do and the difference is between me putting the pressure on myself to come up with something and me leaning on the Holy Ghost to show me some things. Now, this is our first in a Bible study for Sunday school, and we're going to be looking at the book of Romans, um, a wonderful book and very needful for the time that we live in. And I think it's a very substantial book for a church to be founded on. So when I founded uh, Bible, not Bible Believers, Broken Heart Baptist Church, 
and that by now that must be like 20 years ago, wouldn't it? Or more. When I first uh, started that, my first job as a pastor, although I, I, I really don't consider it a job, I don't want to say it's a job, it's not a vocation, it's a calling, but, but the first expository message that I taught was the book of Acts. That was the first Sunday school lesson I, that I've had. And, and I've learned a lot since then, and I've been convinced that many churches head down that wrong path, focusing on Acts. You know, I, I hear people all the time talk about how they want their church to be an Acts church, which that's a very wrong approach because the Acts, the book of Acts is a transitional book that really doesn't have anything to do with how a church should run today. It has to do with uh, a transition between the Old Testament law and Judaism into the New Testament and Christianity and signs and wonders and miracles that God showed along that path in order to guide those apostles and those who wrote the actual New Testament to guide them and direct them into all truth because that's what the Holy Ghost we're studying on Sunday um, the, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost leads us into all truth amen so I don't want to give the impression that when I taught the, taught the book of Acts that I taught it as a model for the church because I didn't I understood even clear back then decades ago that that was not a model for the New Testament church. To the contrary, the Lord showed me very early on that the book of Acts is transitional, showing the signs and wonders, as I said before, that God performed in guiding Israel. At that point in time, his focus was still Israel. If you, if you pay attention to some of the verses that talk about salvation, it says things like, to the Jew first, <laughs> yes. and also to the Gentile. And so God was showing signs and miracles because the Jew requires a sign in order to get them to pay attention and recognize that Jesus was their Messiah and he was transitioning them from the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace. And so this isn't even an inner this message this morning is not even going to be an introduction to the book of Romans. What it is, it's going to be a preparation for the book of Romans. Because we can't even do an introduction until we kind of prepare our hearts, our minds, our thought processes to what we're even going to be talking about. So, while it's important, the book of Acts and, and God showing the Jews stuff, it's probably at some point the Holy Ghost will lead me to teach those the lessons at this church of the book of Acts because it is an important book but it's not right now the Holy Ghost hasn't led me to that he's led me to teach the book of Romans and I do and I'm actually excited about it because man we live in a time when the book of Romans is needed now if I was to just say one book in the Bible that is a guideline for the church it would be the book of Romans. The book of Romans is the, a book that defines the New Testament church. Acts has already passed. The transition has been made. And Paul is laying the foundation. What's the foundation according to the word of God? The foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's laying the foundation for the church age. And, and I say it somewhat tongue-in-cheek because there's no single book that defines the church. But if I had to pick... One book, if, if I had a, a pastor that was studying under me that said, what is one book, if I, I can only have one book, what is the book that I should use to guide this church, to guide Christians in their daily walk? I'd say the book of Romans. I'd say the book of Romans. The book of Romans is the, uh, and, and by the way, it is the Pauline epistles, and the book of Romans was written by Paul, but it's the Pauline epistles that define the church and we have to take each one of those epistles into consideration it is the Apostle Paul who completely and totally um, wrote to the church now this morning we're not going to get too far along but as a matter of fact like I said we're not even getting going to get into the introduction of the book of Romans because I find it's helpful to do 
a preparation and then after the preparation work next week we'll do an introduction if we have time I don't even know that we're gonna have time to get to we might have to have two weeks of preparation I don't know but if we have time we're gonna do an introduction and then after that we're gonna actually dive in and do an actual Bible study on the book of Romans now just a few sentences ago I guess I, I made mention of the church needs to follow the Pauline epistles and um, why would I say that that we need to follow the Pauline epistles I mean most Christians think that the entire Bible this seems to rattle on a lot that the entire Bible um, is uh, for the church age and that's not true <laughs> the Pauline epistles are for the church age now this church is a dispensational church and you can't um, get away from dispensations if you want to understand your Bible you have to understand dispensations and but there's just like any biblical concept there's people that take things too far there's a group that we call hyper dispensationalists what's a hyper dispensationalist there's somebody that took dis disposition not dispositions <laughs> dispensations way too far and they say the only thing we should ever read study or talk about are the Pauline epistles and yet that's contrary to scripture because the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable and and, and so you don't throw away the, everything except the Pauline epistles um, but then there's also hypo dispensationalists that's folks that don't take dispensationalism far enough and so that's why the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. We'll look at that later. But um, I taught before that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and he is. Look at Romans, it's a book we're going to be studying, but look at Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. Romans 11, 13. We're going to look at a little bit of Bible. It's not going to be as much because the Bible study isn't starting yet, but we're going to look at some Bible. Romans 11, 13, Paul says, because Paul wrote the book of Romans, he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, when you read this verse, you've got to make some clarity here, because people read that and they misunderstand that. They think Paul's somewhat bragging on himself, but... Right here in the book that we're getting ready to study, God identifies, not Paul, because God is the one that wrote the Bible. He used men, but God wrote it. And God identifies Paul as the apostle of the Gentiles. And beyond that, God places emphasis on it because Paul goes on to say he magnifies his office. He isn't magnifying himself or his ministry, folks. He's magnifying his office of the apostle to the Gentiles. That's important. Paul's saying, it's important that you Gentiles get this. I am the one that God chose not, and it's not about him, it's about the office. I am the one that God chose to teach you Gentiles about salvation, and he doesn't say the church age, but that's exactly what he's talking about. He's magnifying not himself, he's magnifying the office that God gave him, not because of him, as a matter of fact, Paul later on says that he's not even worthy to be called an apostle, let alone be an apostle, you know, actually being one. And so, so he's magnifying his office because his office is one of the most important things that through all world history <laughs> that ever existed. Paul is going to teach the entire Gentile world how to be saved and how to do church business and how to do governance of the church. And this means that the Gentiles need to follow Paul's teaching rather than the teachings of others. Now, here's a, here's a distinct point. The Bible is written, every book of the Bible, every paragraph of the Bible, every verse of the Bible, every sentence of the Bible, every word of the Bible was written for us. So the Old Testament's for us. The tribulation books are for us. But not all of it's written to us. Those others are written for us to learn, for us to understand the character of God. But the, ver the, the actual 
uh, Bible that's written to us as church age saints is limited completely to the Pauline epistles. So when you get into things like Hebrews and and First and Second Peter and and, and um, um, Jude and things like that, those aren't written to us. They're written for us, but they're not. They're written to the tribulation folks. And we need to have that understanding. The Pauline epistles. Paul is the apostle for the church age, and his uh, epistles are specifically written to us for us to follow. Now that doesn't mean that we discard the other books and we ignore them and that we don't try and learn from them and live in, a, in accordance with them because we do. So um, Gentiles need to follow Paul's teaching rather than that of others. And let's look at some verses. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is a Pauline epistle. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. Give me a chance to get a sip while people are... 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul's talking and he says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So Paul is a teacher to the Gentiles. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. God bless you. Verse 11. 2 Timothy 1 11. Paul says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. See, Paul is our guy. <laughs> Paul is the one that we're supposed to follow. His letters are written to us. Now, the Bible also, and I, I, I'm not going to go into those verses because it's not pertinent necessarily to this study. I guess if you want to know those verses, send a message to the church and we'll, uh, we'll give you uh, the verses that pertain to it. But Peter... It's kind of funny because the Roman Catholic Church says Peter's the founder of their uh, church, and yet the Bible identifies Peter as the apostle to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. And so why would a church want an apostle to the Jews to be the founder of their Gentile church and not the apostle to the Gentiles? So the scripture makes a distinctive, uh, distinct point of showing us that Paul is our teacher. I gave you at least three witnesses that say that. Paul is our teacher. And you should ask why the scripture makes that point. Well, you're in 2 Timothy 2 already. Just look at verse 15. Um, this should be a memory verse for you if it's not already. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible has divisions. Now I talked about the hypo-dispensationalist that doesn't take dispensationalism far enough. That's somebody that thinks that the Bible is divided into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, that is a division for sure. <laughs> it's a division that can't be argued, but it's not the only two divisions, not by any stretch of the imagination. The Bible has divisions. And we need to recognize and observe those divisions because the Bible says that by studying, we can rightly divide, get it right. Listen, you need to really get this point. It is possible to get it right by study. In studying, you can rightly divide the word of truth. And so the Bible calls those divisions dispensations. I've never understood why so many new Testament, new church uh, age Christians, born again, I believe they're born again, I'm not saying they're not but how many the minute you say you're a dispensationalist they want to cut you off they want nothing to do with you they think dispensations is a man's idea about things and yet dispensations is a very significant biblical concept look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17. Paul's the apostle is writing and he says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation, you see it's a biblical concept, 
a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So what does that verse mean? Unfortunately, we're not going to go into that because our study is just to, right now, I'm just showing you that dispensations are a biblical concept. It's not something that's made up by man. Look at, all these are Pauline epistles too that I'm showing you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Once again, it's Paul. I, I said all these references are going to be from the Pauline epistles. He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. A dispensation. This one's the dispensation of the fullness of times. You're in Ephesians. Just turn over a page to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. Ephesians 3, 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Dispensation, it's a biblical concept, folks. I, I don't know how you can miss it. Look at Colossians chapter 1, and verse 25. Colossians chapter 1, and verse 25. Paul speaking, he says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Here Paul's talking about the dispensation of the church age because it's a dispensation that was given to him for the Gentiles. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Amen. And so the fact that so many Christians get so concerned over a preacher talking about dispensational truth, it's really a testimony to the apostasy and lack of biblical knowledge abounding in the age that we live in. Dispensationalism is not something that's brand new that just came about in the last, I mean, we see it from the first century. We see it after 33 AD where Paul was a first century Christian and he's writing over and over again about dispensations. So we're truly seeing the falling away mentioned in the last days in first, or excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. We're not going to turn there, but it says that in the end times there's going to come a falling away. Well, that falling away has multiple meanings. One meaning is that people are going to quit going to church, which boy, that's happened. That's happened. Churches are struggling. All over. churches that are uh, and startup churches like this one. Oh my gosh! It's like trying to to get a little piece of gold out of a great big boulder of granite that's hardened over centuries, and you you hit it with a hammer a million times, and one little teeny speck of it busts off. Um, and even the established ministries, Christian ministries that were good ministries that were running. 500, uh, 800, 1,000 people, their, their, uh, their services have cut almost in half. The only churches that seem to be thriving are the new age uh, nonsense of, of prosperity preachers that, that, and they're not even really churches, they're just entertainment factories that, that hire, a, and they hire, they pay these band members they hire absolutely phenomenal musicians of professional quality to come in and do a great rock concert. Um, and people go for the entertainment value and feel like they've checked off their box of giving glory to God, which going to a rock concert with music that has lyrics that are not scripture at all is not doing anything to please God. Nothing, nothing. So before we get started on the book of Romans and part of our preparation. I want to take a 30,000 foot view of dispensational truth. A 30,000, what that means is we're not going to dig into it, we're not going to teach a deep lesson on dispensational truth, but we're going to take a 30,000 foot view and from a 30,000 foot view we can see different points in time on how God deals with his people, his creation. And that's what a dispensation by a biblical definition is. It's the way that God deals with his creation 
at a specific point in time. And, and that's even misleading because a dispensation has nothing to do with a specific point in time. Although we can go back historically and we can see where a dispensation switched and we can now, after it's happened, define specific points in time. But I don't believe for a minute that God's plan and his program said, you know, like on this date at this time, we're going to start this dispensation. That it didn't work that way. Um, man, after all, is given a free will. And in spite of man's free will, this shows the sovereignty of God. Besides man's free will and man's ability to choose whatever man wants to choose, in the end of the day, God's plan is going to be fulfilled to complete and perfect um, fulfilling even though man can choose everything just opposite of what God wants man to choose because God did give man that free will. And which brings, I mean, we could take a bunny trail on that showing how the things that God gets blamed for really has more to do with man's free will than it has anything to do with God. Um, if, and people say, well, why did God allow it if God could stop it? Because God is a God that gave us a free will. <laughs> And it's you or other people. You may not be the one that brought the circumstances into your life, but some other person did. And God allows man to have that free will. So that basic definition of the word dispensation is as it specifically applies to the Bible would be the way God deals with his creation at any point in time but not based on that point in time. It's when that switch made, that point in time exists, but up until that switch, I don't necessarily think, and there's one scripture, that there's one biblical premise that, that um, might get you to say, well, it is based on points in time, and that would be when Jesus is talking about the end, and he says, uh, no man knoweth not, no, not even the, the angels, only the Father knows the exact point in time. Yet, um, maybe nobody knows it because it is it is based on some circumstances and what man chooses to do at any given point in time. So, let's don't get caught up in the point in time thing because the dispensation starts and ends whenever God says it starts and ends and that's the end of the story. So, let's take a look at it. So, God does not see things in the same way that man sees things. Uh, the Bible says that our ways are not God's ways and God's ways are not our ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts and His thoughts are not our thoughts. As far as heaven is from earth is how much higher God's thoughts are than our thoughts. And God, God sees things cyclical. He says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. So here's God standing on all of time, and he's at the beginning and he's at the end at the same time. Man can't visualize things that way. They can't see things because man looks at this and they go, well, if he's here and this is the beginning, Alpha, and this is the ending, Omega, how in the world can he see things down here clear across from him? He can't. <laughs> We can't see that. Why? Because man sees things in a straight line. Man sees things in a straight line. So the first dispensation of man is a very short dispensation as far as we know, but we don't have a timeline on it because the Bible could be that it was, it was hundreds of years. We don't know. We don't. could be it was thousands of years. We, now, I know that there's, there's folks who study the Bible and they go back and they... They take uh, um, the genealogies and they go back on how long people lived and all that stuff before they died. And they come to the conclusion that the Old Testament, the whole time of the Old Testament from Genesis to Mal Malachi, uh, I had an Italian preacher one time, he was Italian, he said, the only Italian prophet, Malachi, well, no, it's Malachi. But they would define that time based on genealogies as approximately 4,000 years. And of course, the time of the New Testament is approximately, and I say approximately because they don't go right on the 4,000th year or the 2,000th year, but approximately 2,000 years. So 
this short period of time, right here, God created Adam and he created Eve and um, that dispensation started and it must be noted and stressed that God and his heavenly host existed before this. So it's not the first dispensation in all history. This is the first dispensation of God's creation on earth and mankind. Um, us, our dispensations start at this point. So let's look at some specific distinctions about how God dealt with his creation through each of these uh, dispensations. And I'm going to acknowledge right off the fact that this is a brief talk on dispensational truth and it can certainly take, we can go way deeper in this, but that's not the purpose of this study. So this is the Garden of Eden. And I'm not going to spell it out all out. I'll just go G-E, Garden of Eden. In that dispensation, man didn't need salvation. So down here I'm going to talk about salvation. And this is dispensation number one. No need for salvation. At that point, man was created, and we're not now. I've taught this over and over again, and I'm not going to go into this lesson again, but man was originally created in God's image. We're no longer in God's image. But when man was created in God's image, he was going to live for eternity. And he was going to... Um, um, have fellowship with God. The Bible talks about Adam and Eve being able to walk with God in the cool of the day. They were able to see God face to face because there was no sin. Sin is the entire problem. And the only thing that they had to do to keep this going was not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, the second they ate of it, their spirit died. God told them that in the day that he, he could have said, in the second that you eat of that, but he said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, he wasn't talking about their body dying, and all the Bible scoffers in the world say, yeah, but if you look at the Bible, Adam and Eve lived for hundreds of years after they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Their bodies did. Their spirit died immediately. Remember, they were created in God's image, a live soul, a live spirit, and a live body, just like God. When they ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, their spirit died and they were no longer in God's image. And the Bible teaches that now we are created in Adam's image. We have a live soul, we have a live body, but our spirit is dead. Our spirit is dead. The minute we sin, and we're gonna see that when we study the book of Romans. So there's no need of salvation. Uh, man was still uh, free of sin. He had daily fellowship with God. The Bible refers to God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. It was a time of perfection and continual fellowship with God. What a glorious time that must have been. And God had only one requirement. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it ended in catastrophe. Because man violated that one commandment that he was given. And the result was the fall of of all mankind catastrophe from that point on man's fellowship with God was broken man was placed under a curse and he was kicked out of the garden of Eden so the next age the next uh, dispensation and for those of you that know me I'm not the world's greatest speller so I'm gonna have to go back and look It's called the Anadiluvian Dispensation. Now, Anadiluvian is kind of a big word. Um, it's, this is also referred to as the Dispensation of, of Conscience. And uh, why the word Anadiluvian? Because scholars think they have to invent these $25 names in order to show how brilliant they are and so you could look at them and say wow what a great big brain that scholar has and all antediluvian means is prior to the flood so this took place from the fall of mankind to the flood of Noah and and um, how did they get saved at that point in time well if you go back so this is dispensation 
number two. I should have put the two there, but you get it. Uh, this one here, after Adam and Eve sinned, God sacrificed a lamb and he gave the skins to Adam and Eve for clothing. And God set a precedence that there had to be a sacrifice. Did I spell that right? There had to be a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and he spe specified it was a lamb. And you can say, well, in Genesis, it just said he killed an animal. It didn't say it was a lamb. Yeah, but if you compare Scripture with Scripture, you can find verses that say that the lambs were given to us for clothing. So God, when he gave the, the clothing, he gave it from a lamb because the lamb was given for us for clothing. And so there was an understanding there that they had to do this blood sacrifice. And that understanding is obvious because when uh, Cain and Abel had that brought there, when it came time for them to bring a sacrifice, number one, they knew that they were supposed to bring a sacrifice. <laughs> yep. So God had set the precedence. And number two, they knew it was supposed to be a lamb and a blood sacrifice because Abel brought a lamb just like he was supposed to and his sacrifice was accepted. Cain, on the other hand, brought from his vegetable garden. He said, I've worked hard to raise these beautiful vegetables and I'm going to bring a vegetable and God's going to have to take that because that's what I do for a living. And that flies in the face of all Christianity today who says you can come to God however you want to come to God because God had no respect for Cain's sacrifice. And Cain got all, uh, you know, hurt about it and ticked off and, and steam coming out of his ears. He was mad at God. And God asked Cain, he said, what are y'all angry for? If, if you do right, won't it be accepted? If you bring what I told you to bring, if you bring a blood sacrifice like I told you, you, you would have been accepted. And so... At this point in this dispensation, there hadn't been a law yet. The law was written on man's heart. That's why it's called the dispensation of conscience. Um, though there was no written word of God, however, man was given that conscience that, that would convict him when he did something wrong. And uh, sacrifice was established in the Garden of Eden at the fall of mankind when God killed the lamb and provided the skin for Adam and Eve to clothe themselves man was taught that there had to be a blood sacrifice given because of their sin and this too ended in total catastrophe because man had the ability to sear their conscience with a hot iron look at 1st Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 1st Timothy chapter 4 in verse 2, I can see by the clock that we're probably not even going to get through this uh, preparation. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. See, man can keep violating his conscience, and his conscience over that violation gets weaker and weaker and weaker. That's why I taught that sin loves company. The more people you can get doing it, guess what? Your conscience gets weaker about it. You feel better about it. And you think it's okay, and yet it's not okay. So man had the tendency to do that which was right in their own eyes. You see that phrase commonly throughout the Old Testament. Man did that which was right in his own eyes. And man's idea of right and wrong is wrong. <laughs> Our ways are not God's ways, and God's ways are not our ways. To be saved, you needed to obey your conscience. And when you failed in that endeavor, you needed to offer a lamb as a sacrifice for your sin. And this dispensation ended with Noah's flood and God destroying all of his creation except for the animals that were taken on the ark and Noah's immediate family. And this brings on the third dispensation. And uh, this, one's, this one's actually going to be a pretty big one. So this one is the dispensation of the law. The dispensation of the law. And um, it's also referred to by the scholars as the Mosaic Dispensation because it was God, God. If you go out throughout history, people say, why do you follow a man? God has always used a man to lead his people. Always. And God chose Moses to 
lead his people out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. God called Moses to lead his people out of the world. Christians are not supposed to be of this world. They're in the world, but they're not supposed to be of this world. And so um, God led his people out of the world, and then he used Moses, and he transcribed to Moses the law. In the Ten Commandments, when they were first written, and the second time, because Moses broke the stones the first time, says they were written by the very finger of God. God engraved in that stone the law. And so God always makes a way for his creation to restore fellowship with him because he's a loving God. He's long-suffering. He's patient. Um, he's full of grace and mercy. And he recognized the depravity of man. And he chose a people. He chose a people, which is Israel. And he chose a man, which was Moses. The people, uh, uh, when God chose a people, it was expected that Israel would evangelize the world and convert Gentiles to Judaism. It was not a um, lineage... Um, you know, uh, pedigree thing. It was it was a way of life, and the Jews were supposed to be actively working to proselyte Gentiles to be saved in this dispensation. By the way, this this salvation of sacrifice, it is grace, grace, and I'm not going to write this every time because grace is always a part of salvation. It is grace. It is faith. And it is, uh-oh, that dirty word, works. If you didn't do what you're supposed to do, you didn't get in. It's that simple. So this third one, this third dispensation, God said your conscience doesn't work. So I'm going to write it out for you so you can see it. So you got the law. In order to be saved, you had to live up to the law. And what is that called? That's called works. And if you couldn't live up to the law, God had grace. And by your faith, when you did the appropriate, what did I do wrong? Grace. Oh, I forgot the R in grace. <laughs> Uh, when you did wrong, by faith you could take in the appropriate sacrifice and atone. It didn't take care of your sins because the Bible teaches in Hebrews that the blood of rams and of goats could never take away the sins of man. But it did put it in a holding place until the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shed His blood for the people. So to be saved, you had to, in this dispensation, you had to convert to Judaism and follow the law and the law outlined specific sacrifices uh, with specific meanings. There was more than just one type of sacrifice. There was a wave offering, a sin offering, a peace offering. There were all kinds of offerings. We're not going to go into that. This dispensation also ended in catastrophe. Uh, as Israel got puffed up and thought they were above everyone else, they thought it was their pedigree and not just the choosing of God. And they felt just by being born a Jew, you were good to go, and you weren't. And so they failed to evangelize the world and had no interactions with the Gentiles. But God is not willing that any should perish in any dispensation. And God spoke to Israel through prophets who eventually penned the Old Testament, the entire book, not just the Pentateuch, but the entire Old Testament. Uh, guess what? There's not a single book in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, that wasn't penned by a Jew. So the prophes prophesied of a Jewish Messiah. It spoke of, the f of a first advent, and it spoke of a second advent, and though it never defined them as such. And so the Jews failed to see that thing. There were probably somewhere around 80 to 85, maybe even 90% of the prophecies of the Messiah was the second advent and not the first advent. So the Jews missed the prophecies of the first advent. Therefore, they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah because they never saw him coming in as a sacrificial lamb. They saw him coming in as a conquering king. And when Jesus came in as a sacrificial lamb and a servant, they said, this can't be the guy. Now, 
I think that the religious leaders knew that he was a Messiah, and, and I'm not going to go into that today. Um, that's for a different lesson. But I think that they knew that he was the Messiah, but they figured if they killed him, they wouldn't lose their power over the people. And so because of the fact that the prophecies were hidden, they were able to convince the masses that this couldn't be our Messiah. And so this brought us to our current dispensation, which is a, a shorter one. And that's the dispensation of the church age. Isn't this good? Hopefully some of your eyes are being opened. And um, the church age is a very, very unique dispensation. It is the only dispensation in all of God's dispensations where none of it relies on you. No works involved at, at all. Salvation is by grace through faith. Grace through faith. And that is the only um, means to be saved. And we're kind of out of time. So we're going to stop there. We're going to continue with this lesson on pre preparation for the book of Romans. It's important that you get all of this. It's important that you understand what we're talking about here. And so um, we're going to end here. Let's, let's go to word and prayer. Lord, we do pray for your blessing on the upcoming message. Lord, I pray that this will really help some people understand dispensational truth, and that you'd open some eyes and people begin to see the significance of rightly dividing the word of truth, which incidentally, all the new perverted English Bibles take that whole idea of divisions in that verse away from it. They take away the requirement to study. They take away the requirement or, or the um, the uh, manifestation that there are different dispensations, different divisions, the way you deal with your creation. God, help people to see. Remove the scales from their eyes. And please, bring a blessing upon this upcoming uh, service. We praise you for all that you do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How is this so